Hello, everybody. It's such an immense honor and treat to launch into holiday edition December 2023 version Living Histories with uh, the iconic Professor Lucy Shapiro, a living legend. Please tell us <laughs> about Living Histories. Uh, okay, here comes the legend. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to be as informal as I can about this. Uh, I think I have a rather unusual trajectory because I started out as an artist and a painter and studying the Italian Renaissance. Went to the High School of Music and Art in New York City, uh, then uh, went to Brooklyn College where I majored in fine arts uh, and became interested in biology because I supported myself by doing illustrations for the local syllabi in the sciences. Uh, and as time went by, I became more and more interested in biology, but basically I was a painter and I still paint. Uh, my life has been one major turning point after another. And in each time I tried to jump into a world that I didn't know about. I tried to ask questions that were big and hard. And to do that, I had to learn things that I knew nothing about. So when I was graduating from college, a professor at Rockefeller University bought one of my paintings and he had this thing about finding young people in the arts. And if he decided they had a certain way of thinking, convince them to go into science, to keep the creative spark going. So Ted Shedlowski sent me off to take an organic chemistry course. I had no background, but it turned out that this is how my mind worked. And it was fabulous. I loved it. It, it opened up a whole new way of thinking and working. And that began my career as a scientist. He sent me off to a lab in New York so that I would learn what it was like to be a bench scientist. Remember, I had pretty sparse training. Where did he send me? He sent me to Jerry Hurwitz and the jungle biochemists, first at NYU and then at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, needless to say, in the lab at the time was Jerry Hurwitz, David Baltimore, Stan Cohn, just an incredible collection of really exciting people asking exciting questions. This was the dawn of the biochemistry of the revolution in molecular biology. And my training took place all over New York City. I had to, I, ne I never had any biology really as a graduate student, except biochemistry, physics, statistical mechanics, chemistry, uh, anything that taught me how to think logically, systematically, and analytically. Once I finished my thesis work, which was all biochemistry and the first RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, uh, I did six months as a postdoc and was asked to join the faculty of the department that I had just graduated from. Uh, and that was a challenge because I decided to work on something completely different. Again, jumping off into an area that I didn't know much about. And that was facilitated by the chair of my department, Bernie Horaker, who said, Lucy, I want you to take three months off and just think and read and don't start working in the lab. And I went, wow, okay. Uh, and I took those three months and what a gift uh, to decide what big question did I really care about. And remember, this was the dawn of the molecular biology revolution. And my question was simple. How does a cell go from a two-dimensional genetic code to three-dimensional space? How does a cell figure out how to divide asymmetrically and give you two daughters that have different cell fates? And remember, I was trained as a biochemist. I knew no microbiology. I knew no genetics, but I had a question. And to do that, I said, well, what I need is something simple. I need my hydrogen atom. 
And to me, that was the simplest bacterial cell I could find. And that turned out to be Colobacter, which exhibited positional information and asymmetric division. And I treated this cell as a test tube doing in vivo biochemistry. And I had to learn microbiology. I ultimately learned genetics. You can't do anything unless you can perturb your system and make mutants. And so that was a big transition. The next transition, of course, was realizing that in order to get real answers, I needed an interdisciplinary lab. I needed physics, engineering, chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, and genetics. And I started a collaboration with someone who was a good friend, happened to be my husband, who was a Bell Labs physicist, who had moved with me to Stanford. And he immediately got a faculty position and had his own lab of physicists and engineers. And we did something unusual. We combined these two groups. So in one bay, we had a physicist working next to an, a, gen, a geneticist, a biochemist working next to an engineer. An engineer we would send off to Cold Spring Harbor to learn how to clone genes. And if he followed a protocol and it didn't work, the engineer said, my God, the bridge will fall down. Uh, we had to teach each other our languages. We had to teach each other the power of bringing together interdisciplinary work. We ultimately, put together the entire genetic network, which was akin to an electrical engineering circuit that controlled the regulation of this very simple cell. And then as this work was going on and I was admitted to the National Academy and I realized I had a bully pulpit, I became very interested in problems that were global, like emerging infectious diseases, emerging infection, uh, antibiotic resistance. And I realized that I could probably influence what was happening, not only nationally, but globally. And I began talking everywhere I could talk. I even was invited by Clinton to speak to his cabinet about worries that he had about bioterrorism. And it was when my turn to talk, I said, nature was a much better bioterrorist than anybody that you can produce for me from humanity. And he said, what are you talking about? And I then taught Clinton and his whole cabinet about E. coli 0157 and how you can, how nature genetically engineers pathogens and that how you deal with that is the same way you would deal with a malevolently engineered uh, organism. And then finally, and this is my final leap into the unknown, I decided that what we needed was new pharmaceuticals that dealt with, uh, with really infectious diseases of all kinds. And so I got a hold of Steve Benkovic at Penn State, who is a visionary chemist. And we decided that we were gonna make a new chemical space for drugs. And this new chemical space was gonna be based on boron at the active site, not carbon. And when we floated this idea, I cannot tell you how you know, awful people were to us, uh, but we persevered. Uh, Steve made all these fabulous boron-based compounds. I tested them. They were incredibly active against a variety of pathogens. And when we replaced the carbon, the boron with carbon, we lost all activity. So we pulled our resources, we uh, patented and got the exclusive license to our patents, and we built Anacor, which was ultimately sold to Pfizer with two FDA approved drugs for $5.2 billion. And to this day, that stuff is growing. And we took that money and started using our boron library for agriculture. Because to me, that is one of the biggest problems of climate change. And so now I've just given you this gigantic 35,000 feet flyover of my 50 years uh, in science, starting out as a naive little art student at Brooklyn College, 
and winding up at Stanford, building a new department of developmental biology and trying, actually trying to help global health. That's my story. Thank you. Uh, wow. Thank you so much, Lucy. On behalf of the audience, I'm clapping. Um, I'm going to start with a uh, question, burning question from me and then take one from the audience. Um, the question from me is that um, you trained as an artist. Yes. And I am curious to hear how that influenced not only how you answer the questions you post, but even the questions themselves. Yeah, well, I think that being interested in how a cell architecture comes about. Remember, when I started in this back in any bacterium, it was believed to be like a swimming pool. Uh, no, no internal structure. Well, I knew this was impossible. That was ridiculous. And a cell is a cell, and it has to know where things are. And because, well, first of all, I have an eidetic memory, which means when I see something, I take a photograph. That's why I could get an A in organic chemistry. I memorized the book. Uh, but the other thing is I could move things around in space and see it. So that did influence how I was going to approach this big problem in my hydrogen atom, my simple cell. And in fact, the cell is exquisitely organized. And we did figure out how this works in this simple cell. So yes, I think that the way our minds work and the way we see things absolutely influences our science and the design of our experiments. But always go for the big question. It's easy to get lost in the weeds. Wow. Yeah, you need weeds, but keep the big question there. Wow, powerful words. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Question from Nikhil. Uh, he wants to know how you pass on the interdisciplinary research tradition to your group members. Um, he's specifically highlighting the example of Christine, his yes. former colleague. Yeah. Yes. Uh, look, I think one of the most important parts of our interdisciplinary lab is we met weekly group meetings at weekly group meetings. And if a physicist was describing his or her experiments, she or he had to use language that we all understood. And it turned out to be an important thing, this language. Uh, we had to know what we were talking about when we talked about a genetic cross or when we talked about a circuitry gate. We had to know what we meant. So we were constantly teaching each other. And in fact, all the students and postdocs that have come out of that group have run interdisciplinary labs. And it was extremely important to me that our physicists and engineers didn't rely on the bench scientists to get their data. They had to know where the data came from. That's why we sent them all to Cold Spring Arbor to learn how to do the experiments, to learn what genetics was. But my biology students had to have Mathematica over their desk uh, you know, you have to learn how to think analytically. So a true collaboration is not give me something and I will apply my expertise. It's thinking. It's thinking in each other's brains. And that's what makes interdisciplinary work so powerful. Wow. Um, music to my ears. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me wrap up with one final question, Lucy which is that even as you had a bully pulpit, you gave an example of um, doing something that people question the very idea of doing. Uh, and I want you to specifically tell us some tricks for how to approach being called crazy. This idea will never work. <laughs> uh, well, look, the, the secret is, Number one, to be confident. And if you're not confident, act confident. <laughs> and if you're secure in what you think you're doing is going to be important, you can just get through it. And uh, just not be intimidated by anybody. And I don't know what my parents did, but they did something right somewhere uh, because I'm simply not. 
And, uh, you know, I'm also willing to fail. We do fail. Of course we fail. But I'm willing to take the chance. And we should all be willing to take the chance. Thank you so much, Lucy, again, on that very inspiring note, uh, thanking you on behalf of the audience and closing the recording. Uh, that was a super inspiring talk.